Okay, it's recording now. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our second series in the Love Your Lady Parts webinar. Um, today, we're talking all things preconception, uh, preparing for pregnancy, and then pregnancy changes from, um, I'm, I'm Carly, I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist. I specialize in postpartum rehab, orthopedics, um, pelvic floor PT, and I am the founder of Empowered Public Health. I have a concierge women's health physical therapy business in Bergen County, New Jersey. So, and with me, Miss Erin. Yeah. And uh, my name is Erin Gattuso. I am a naturopathic doctor. I work at Term Paul Health and Wellness in Mannheim, Pennsylvania. Um, and I see anywhere from infancy to um, menopause, basically. So I really only treat um, women and children and infants. And um, I, disclaimer, Carly and I are really good friends from college. And so that's how we know each other. And it just so happens that we share um, this unique interest in pelvic health. And so we thought it'd be really fun to put this uh, series together. And then just a friendly reminder, any donations from today benefit the National Birth Equity Collaborative. Um, whose goal is to minimize discrepancies in black maternal and infant health postpartum. So we're learning, we're doing good. Let's rock. Okay. Do you want to go through our objectives? Sure. <clears throat> so for t uh, today, our objectives, we're going through preconception a lot with Erin. It's really great information. Um, preparing for pregnancy. Towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about infertility, both from... Uh, you know, the female and male perspective. Um, we're going through pelvic floor anatomy, systemic changes during pregnancy to the entire body, how it affects us posturally, symptoms that may arise. Um, we're gonna go through some basic, you know, a couple of exercises and muscle groups to target on during pregnancy to help minimize those symptoms. And then talk about when pelvic floor physical therapy is appropriate, especially during pregnancy, because we treat, you know, prenatal, pregnancy, postpartum, we can see through the entire um, process. Yeah. Okay. So um, when we talk about preconception care, I really like to think about it as conscious conception because ultimately the, co the idea of bringing a child into this earth is one of the most sacred things that we do as human beings. And so I could throw just like science at you and I will throw some just science at you, but to ignore kind of the mind, body, spirit aspect of it, um, it it's not an accurate representation of what I feel like we're trying to do here. So um, when we talk about preconception, yes, the ultimate goal is to, you know, decrease the risk of miscarriage, um, decrease the risk of of um, like preterm delivery and any other complications that come with it. But also it's about preparing the soil, um, for lack of better terms, um, for a, an egg to um, implant. And um, that's true on a physical level. And that's also true on a mental, emotional and spiritual level as well. So um, just to kind of start with it, I really like to go through, um, so er, most traditional medicines in the world have some period of preconception care. In fact, in a lot of cultures, that preconceptive care piece is um, almost even more emphasized than pregnancy itself because they understand that you have to have healthy soil for a healthy baby. Um, and unfortunately, that is lost. Um, we might do a few checkups before someone decides to get pregnant, but um, usually it's rather minimal and it's not a holistic um, picture of everything. So um, just to kind of highlight, so um, in traditional Chinese medicine, of course, they consider nourishing the reproductive system with qi through the meridians and that's through acupuncture and massage and herbal medicine. My and uterine massage, they actually do a lot of um, abdominal and uterus massage um, to help strengthen the uterus. Um, 
And the one that I'm going to highlight the most is actually the Ayurvedic. So Ayurvedic, it means that it is um, from India and the medicine that was traditionally used there. It's often associated with yoga. Um, but how they like to do it there is they like to start conscious conception preparation six months before someone actually wants to get pregnant. And the first phase of it, the first one to three months, basically it's this concept of you have to pull the weeds and calm the fire. So that's true on every level of the human being. So from an emotional perspective, there's an emotional detox. And so this, they encourage people to um, actually go to counseling with their partner uh, and more than anything, decide what patterns are you going to leave behind that are not going to serve you in this next phase of whether it's your first child or your fifth child. Um, every child brings, you know, something new to your life. So this is in a way how we break generational trauma by having this conscious decision of how we're going to shift things. Um, and during this time, they also are do um, a highly anti-inflammatory diet. So they take away gluten, dairy, sugar, caffeine, alcohol. Um, they increase detox pathways and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, and they really focus on calming the digestive fire. So this is like, you know, a 3000 year old recipe for having a healthy pregnancy. And now we kind of understand from a modern medicine perspective, why that traditional wisdom is very real. And I think that it's more relevant than other than ever. So they've actually shown that, um, so chemicals and toxins, um, whether it be heavy metal, toxins like mercury and lead or other things that come like phthalates that come from plastic those toxins tend to actually concentrate in the umbilical cord and they pass through their placenta so infants in the womb are actually exposed to a lot of toxins and it's not just the toxins that the mother is exposed to in those moments it's fat soluble toxins that have been stored away from their entire lifetime are mobilized in the pregnancy, especially the first pregnancy, which is why it is so helpful to do a period of detox um, before pregnancy. And that's not to say, if you didn't do that, that there are repercussions or, or problems. Um, I would venture to say that if you did get pregnant, because a lot, over 50% of the pregnancies in America are not planned. They are surprised. So, you know, obviously if that's the case, then you're not doing six month pregnancy prep. That um, takes a lot of willpower. But um, if you accidentally get pregnant, that in itself is an indicator that your soil is fertile enough <laughs> to, to get pregnant. So that's, that's a good sign in a lot of ways. It means that you're healthy enough to easily get pregnant and carry a baby. But that isn't true for everybody. And a lot of people struggle with infertility, which is, so this kind of pregnancy prep is even more important for that population. Um, okay, so what else do I wanna say about that? So yeah, they've, they've shown that like, if you have high levels of heavy metals, it can affect some level of neurodevelopment and actually cause some behavioral issues later on. If you wanna more, read more research on this, then ew.org is a really great resource that um, you can access. Um, as far as different ways to detox your body, I'm gonna actually go back up to what this was. So um, obviously decreasing your inflammation is probably the first start because you have to decrease your inflammation for your body to even begin tox detoxing. Um, but other things you can do are sauna, um, herbs like milk thistle is kind of the most famous one, but for a reason it works really well. Um, dandelion is another really good one. Um, NLCL cysteine um, and skin brushing, which is basically where you move your lymph tissue throughout your entire body, which helps detox you. So this is still considered a very gentle detox. There are more extreme ways to detox. I mean, probably the most invasive way to detox it would be you come in for IV nutrition and we give you 
IV glutathione. But truthfully, that for some people is where they might need to start because they have enough chronic disease that we have to be a little bit more invasive. Um, okay, so gut health. I tried really hard to find some solid research to tell us that, okay, if you have IBS or um, irritable bowel disease or something like that, that you're more likely to have, um, you know, GI distress in pregnancy, because that what is what makes sense. And that's what I was taught. I unfortunately could not find any research to actually indicate that, which I don't think means it's not true. I think that we don't do enough pregnant, we don't do enough research on pregnancy and pregnant women and babies in general. So there's just so much that we don't know and we can't definitively say the correlation. So I say that as a disclaimer, but it makes sense to me and it was what I was taught and I see it when I work with women that if you have IBS or IBD or something called irritable bowel syndrome, before you get pregnant, it's likely to cause a lot more problems in pregnancy because progesterone slows down the digestive tract. And if it's already wonky, it's gonna get wonkier. Um, but then also creates higher levels of inflammation, inflammation throughout the pregnancy. So people are more prone to headaches and different things like that. So what I, I was able to find was LPS, which is basically a toxin that comes from bacterial imbalance in the gut. Um, if you do have high levels of LPS, you are at a higher risk of miscarriage and preterm births. So that is significant. So there is a correlation, but um, I still think that there's a lot of research that needs to be done to really definitively say that. Um, so this is all part of the first phase of this preconceptive care. Decrease um, your inflammation by, you know, taking out those inflammatory foods, um, detox your body, and um, there's not a slide on this, but I was researching this a good amount on the Ayurvedic um, perspective, and they actually even recommend that in the first three months, you actually abstain from having sex with your partner, which some people might say, wait, what, why? Um, but the concept of it, I thought was really interesting which was in Ayurveda, basically they say that um, when you do that, it, it, it basically can reframe your relationship with your partner um, to be an even like deeper on a spiritual level um, connection with your partner, which whenever, so basically it's this transition of lust to let's bring a soul into this world, um, and that transition should be very conscious. And so whenever you kind of abstain for those first three months, not only are you giving your body time to just like um, acclimate to itself, um, but you're also making that conscious decision to try to prepare, you know, for that baby as much as possible, which I found interesting. Also, as far as sperm goes, they say that it makes the sperm more potent, which leads to a healthier baby and an increased fertility. So second half of this conscious conception aspect um, is nourish the soil. So basically after you pull all the weeds, so you basically detox your body, it, you will find yourself more clear um, on a mental and emotional level. Um, you will have less inflammation on a physical level. Um, and so now you are at a place where it is easier to actually find joy and build with your partner. So this is really important um, because this is kind of the feed and nourish the soil so that you have a lot of vitality and a strong immunity to bring a baby into this world. Um, and during this time, you also do more blood building herbs and foods. If vegetarian, um, this is when you would introduce some animal products. So one thing I will say is that no traditional medicine or anywhere in the world recommends veganism um, during pregnancy. So even, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> even in India, where <laughs> most of the population is vegetarian, um, they recommend that during this preconceptive 
phase, this second half of it, is whenever you introduce those blood building foods to prepare for pregnancy, which I think is great. And they also just say like, this is a very playful time where you're going on dates and you have love letters and you build the love that you initially have um, at the beginning of a romance, but sometimes begins to fade away a little bit. But by abstaining for a short period of time, it basically reignites that like, that intensity of newness of love basically. And um, so that whenever you do decide to have intercourse, um, which they, they recommend that you start intercourse in the sixth month, but they say that if you start in the third month, that that's like kind of okay too. Um, but like that it, that th that connection also is going to influence your child, which I believe, I think it makes sense to me, but you know, of course we don't have evidence for that. That's not, that's like a double blind um, placebo control study on that. Um, okay, so whenever it comes, so that's a sec, that's what traditional knowledge teaches us, and we know that um, immune regulation is really, really important for pregnancy, and you can go down a really dark spiral with this, but the reason why I put this up there is because it's really important now for functional, like a functional medicine doctor to come in and assess where your inflammation levels are at, if you have levels of autoimmunity, um, and what would you need to support your body to lower um, any autoimmune titers that you already have? Because autoimmune, um, or I should say autoantibodies actually are able to cross through the placenta and they can cause some really significant challenges during pregnancy. Um, and even on a minor level, they can promote allergies and actual immune dysregulation in that baby then. So the good thing is, is that we can do a lot to regulate our immune system beforehand. And I will say um, that pregnancy itself can put autoimmune, um, a lot of autoimmune conditions into remission, but not always. And so it is still good to prepare your body for that. Um, oh. So this comes back to the mind-body connection too. So whenever they say, okay, this is the time to build joy. So there's probably like no better immune regulator in the world than joy. Um, and like that, having that strong mind-body connection. So um, yeah, that would, it kind of all goes together. Um, preconception. So a lot of people would configure that hormone balancing is probably like the top thing to consider whenever you are um, trying to prepare for pregnancy. But I would actually contest that because often what happens is whenever you address the detoxification systems, whenever you address the gut, and whenever you regulate the immune system, often the hormones will fall into place on their own. Um, if that doesn't happen, then you actually don't just jump to estrogen and progesterone, which are the main sex hormones. The next hormone that you really wanna look at is your thyroid. Because if you have a suboptimal thyroid, addressing that first can actually increase fertility enough for a lot of people. So especially if you are going to do something like IVF or even more conventional um, approaches to fertility, they will always check your thyroid, at least they should always check your thyroid. And it's very common that they will put you on thyroid meds as you are going through that process. Um, so that is kind of the first, the first hormone that you think about. Um, and I don't, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about uh, regulating estrogen and progesterone because Truthfully, that gets into an infertility talk, which could be a talk in and of itself. If after you do all those things, those things don't line up, then we have to do a little bit more intensive stuff. Um, but one thing I will say is that I work, I've worked with women who come in and say, well, I'm ovulating. And I say, well, how do you know that you're ovulating? And they say, oh, because I peed on a, you know, an ovulation stick and it told me. So that tests luteinizing hormone, which in certain populations of women, specifically people with polycystic ovarian syndrome, can always be elevated. 
And so it's kind of hard to tell because sometimes um, those will come back positive, even if someone is not ovulating. So I would just recommend that if you had any questions, um, I would definitely, and also I will say, there are other ways to test for ovulation, you know, testing to see where your cervix is, um, testing uh, vaginal mucus um, or discharge. And, um, but even those can be compromised by LH if you have um, PCOS. So the best tried and true way to really tell is either through blood work or you can actually, um, they can tell through ultrasound, which is a little bit more involved, but. Um, and then, yeah, so that's hormones. And now I'm gonna pass this off to Carly. Okay, are you dipping out and I'm dipping in or? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Oh, oh I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. We will stop share. There you go. Share. Okay, so to kind of piggyback off of what Erin was talking about, we're gonna go into some hormones and how your hormones change during pregnancy, um, and also that thyroid. So that thyroid's in overdrive when you're pregnant. So especially getting it prepped before you become pregnant or um, you know, making sure it's, it's firing how it should be prior, super important, because it's gonna, it's gonna have a little bit more work to do when you're pregnant. So during pregnancy, our estrogen increases 30 times to help that uterus grow to start getting um, our breast duct system ready for breastfeeding. Um, progesterone's a big one. So progesterone is the reason why our immune systems are a little bit weaker when we're pregnant, but it's necessary. Progesterone, um, progesterone protects the baby um, and it keeps our body from rejecting because technically it's, it's a foreign object, right? So progesterone is what keeps the baby there. So it's super important to keep those levels in check. Um, and this is what relaxes that, that, that uterine smooth muscle so that it can grow and it can stretch. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, the cuddle hormone, oxytocin, okay? So after baby, the pituitary is releasing oxytocin and prolactin to help with milk production, bonding, um, and oxytocin actually contracts the uterus. So when you're breastfeeding after baby, when uterus is contracting back to normal size, oxytocin is the guy behind it, okay? So we don't want any contractions when we're not ready until labor and delivery, right? So progesterone and oxytocin kind of keep each other in check. So progesterone per, um, protects the baby, right? Protects you. And then oxytocin is what's hard at work once baby comes. Relaxin is a big one for pelvic PTs. It's most prevalent in the first trimester, believe it or not. And it does exactly what it sounds like it's supposed to do. It relaxes. Okay. So here's my, here's my pelvis. Okay. And you can imagine that this bowl of um, your pelvis, your spine, your sacrum has to expand and make room for babies. So, so during pregnancy, we have a lot of joint laxity. We have more mobility in the pelvis to create room for baby and um, to widen that bowl, um, which can cause us some pain and irritation, which we're getting into a little bit later. So systemic changes, what's happening? <clears throat> your cardiovascular system and your respiratory system have higher demand. So our heart rate's increasing. We need more blood volume, more blood production to go to the baby, to go to the placenta. We have more vascularity. The breasts are getting engorged um, up to a pound each. So two extra pounds just in breast weight. That's amazing. Women's bodies are just so amazing. I'm still not over it. Um, we need more oxygen. We need more oxygen, um, oxygen consumption. And this becomes a, a tricky spot, right? And we're going to Get into a little bit later i have a great picture showing but we usually breathe from our diaphragm and it's your respiratory muscle that sits like an umbrella underneath your ribs so if you look at any baby breathe um, when they inhale bellies expanding forward and out they're exhaling with age with postural changes with stress we start breathing from our traps pregnant women uh, especially towards that third trimester kind of have to do this baby's growing there's really not enough room for the diaphragm to descend. All your organs are kind of smushed up. The ribs literally start to flare out, which it's supposed to do, I think up to like 13 degrees. Um, and we have to start breathing with accessory muscles up here to get air in, okay? Because we can't fill those lungs as much and we can't utilize that diaphragm as effectively as we could 
pre-baby. Um, the GI system, so like Aaron was talking about, we have progesterone uh, increasing in the body, protecting baby, making sure baby you know, stays healthy, stays where they should be. Um, but it does slow down the motility of our GI system. So a big complaint that we have with our mamas is constipation, um, not being able to avoid. And, um, and heartburn is a common one. So it's relaxing that smooth muscle in the esophagus. So you're more likely to have um, acidic fluids coming up. And it's you know not such a good feeling, but it's a very common complaint because the progesterone is slowing down the GI system and um, your sphincter control up here just isn't, isn't the same. It's a little bit looser, right? Well, my mamas kind of get a pass on urination as far as frequency. Um, you have a baby pushing on your bladder. Um, and with that increased blood flow, our kidneys are filtering 50% more than they usually would. Um, so you might find that you have to urinate more frequently. Um, you have that pressure on your bladder. We should never be losing it. Um, incontinence at any age or any stage in life is not normal. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but the bladder actually, during this time, we talk about how the smooth muscle is relaxing. So the uterus is growing. The bladder actually grows twice in size too to accommodate for this as well. Um, so the body is super smart. Oh my God, the bladder. I know. Yeah, so it increases in size. Your kidney is filtering faster. Um, so something has to give. And then you have baby pushing on it. And you're like, I got to pee all the time. So you kind of get a pass, but there's, there's reasons behind it, of course. Right. Yeah. We have higher cortisol. We think of cortisol as a stress hormone, which it is. Um, if we're stressed from work or life, you know, it, it kind of makes it hard to, um, to lose weight. We know it packs on fat. During this time, we need extra cushion. We need some more fat for babies. So cortisol um, levels are elevated. Um, we want a little bit more belly fat to protect baby. And like I talked about, the thyroid um, is working in overdrive. So thyroid's working harder and you're more prone to fatigue. And not for nothing, you're carrying around extra weight. It's more work. Your center of gravity has totally shifted forward. Um, so it's kind of just having like a little resistance pack on you uh, for nine months <laughs> that you just keep putting weight into every month. Um, we talk about the glow, right? So with that increased circulation, with especially estrogen, um, women find that they're salivating more, sweating more, and that contributes to that, that glow that we so love. Um, and then at the picture at the body, we can see musculoskeletally how we start to get an increased arch in that low back, okay? So sometimes belly's getting big, baby's going forward, and it starts to win, okay? So what we find with that is, is super common is low back pain, um, just because we're not using that deep core to hold baby in, and we're really gonna hone in on this later. Um, but our center of gravity has shifted so far forward, so we have to think about how it affects our calf muscles, the, the fast twitch muscles in our feet. Um, our posture. So if we have more curve at the low back, usually we start finding ourselves kind of in this forward head posture, that upper back is getting stiff. So we have to make sure that that's staying nice and mobile. Okay, so back to the women's body being one of the most amazing things ever. The uterus grows 500 times in size. So 10 milliliters to 5,000 milliliters in a course of a pregnancy, mind blown, right? So uh, like we talked about with the urinary symptoms, the increased frequency urge that may arise, um, we have a lot of pressure downward into our pelvic organs. We, um, pelvic floor has to work, and we're gonna get into the anatomy a little bit later, but pelvic floor has to really work to protect baby, to protect organs, and it's working really hard. Those muscles are postural muscles, they're always on when you're you know, walking around, sitting, even lying down, they somewhat have some tone to them too. We talked about how baby's growing and the diaphragm doesn't really have much room to go and descend. So we start breathing from up here. The ribs are coming outward to accommodate for baby, for organs. Our lungs are trying to find somewhere to go and our diaphragm somewhere to go to get air in. And then we talked about how that relaxin is widening, um, that hormone relaxin is relaxing those tissues and widening the pelvis to accommodate for baby um, and to prepare our pelvis and our sacrum for childbirth. So to the left, we have the woman, you know, who's not pregnant 
and you see how much room we have for organs, everyone's got space, we're happy. And we go to the right and you can see how as that baby grows, there's less space for all those beautiful organs. So this contributes to that constipation, the urinary frequency, um, you know, the changes in our, in our breathing and our fatigue that can also play a big part into our fatigue. Um, just not being able to use our diaphragm efficiently, having more weight to carry around. Now I'm going to switch it to air. Go ahead. Okay, so let's air this guy. Okay, so. Up, up. I think it was. Maternal. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. There you go. Um, okay, so everybody knows about prenatals. Prenatals, prenatals, prenatals. We all kind of know about that. Um, but the one thing that I would want people to take home from this is if you're going to do a prenatal, really look for a high quality one that doesn't have. Um, the classic folic acid in it. So you actually would probably do better um, with something called, um, well, there's a much bigger name for it, it's methyl tetrahydrofolate, but folate basically. Um, and so this is the already activated version of folate. Um, folic acid is synthetic. Your body actually has to convert it to the active version of folate. Um, if you get it from nature, it's always in the folate version. Nature does not make folic acid. So some people have a really hard time converting that, um, especially people who have the um, MTHFR or, you know, you know what that looks like, um, carrier, um, which is I'll, actually, I think it, I have to look at the stat, but I want to say it's like one fourth of the population has at least um, heterozygous. So um, you have the there's, well, actually, there's many different um, ways you can have that gene. But if you are um, have two copies of that gene, then you really need the folate and the folic acid. Um, actually, there is speculation that it can cause more problems than not. And then you don't actually get the benefit from it, benefit from it either. And so this is really important. And I'm going to actually skip down. I'll come back to this slide. Um, to severe complaints and complications. So obviously like these are kind of like the three worst things that can not, three of, of the top more common things that can happen that really you do need to be um, cared for by an ob um, for these things um, like preeclampsia or eclampsia. So preeclampsia is whenever you have hypertension, um, but not just hypertension, it actually starts causing some organ damage. And so they have found that people who have high rates of this MTHFR gene, um, they have higher levels of something called homocysteine, which you only get if you are not able to use that folic acid. So it all comes back to that, that piece. And so they have found this to be a huge predictor as to whether or not someone is likely to be have that complication. And so that makes sense um, why you need that version of that B vitamin, basically. Um, another thing that you want to really want to look for is DHA. So DHA is a type of fish oil, but it's specifically the part of the oil that um, feeds the central nervous system. So this is basically is what going is what your baby needs to build its brain. And what's interesting is that if you don't have enough of it in your diet, which most people do not, um, I can say we test everybody, not everybody, but we test most people to see where they stand in their omega status. And almost everybody comes back deficient in DHA. Um, so if you do not have enough DHA in your diet, it actually gets taken from you. So this is one of the main reasons why people Home have brain. what's called palm brain. Home exactly. Brain. It's because they they can't think clearly because they literally don't have the building blocks necessary for them to think straight. Um, they're literally this, their brain to baby. Literally, they, oh, the baby is oh, 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 What do you say? It is mind-blowing. It's, it 
it really is. And another place where DHA is really, really important is in um, postpartum depression, but not just post, okay, so postpartum depression is getting a lot more attention these days, which is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. But a lot of women who are actually pregnant also experience depression and that doesn't get as much as highlighted as often. And that can even be more challenging because people feel like, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. I've been wanting to get pregnant for so long and now I am and I'm depressed. Um, and then they don't feel connected to their baby. They don't feel connected to the pregnancy. Um, and so DHA is a big player in that. And so proper supplementation of this nutrient is really important. But here's another caveat to that. Um, fish oils are oils, and so they can go rancid like any other oil. And so you really have to make sure you get a non-rancid form because if you do get rancid fish oils, instead of it actually going and being beneficial for you, it actually becomes oxidative and causes inflammation for you. So it does the exact opposite of what you'd want it to do. So get the expensive fish oils, make sure when you're getting a fish oil that there's um, vitamin E in it. So vitamin E preserves it very nicely. Um, so you wanna look for that. So tocopherols is what that's commonly called. Um, but yeah, so DHA is something to think about. Probiotics are also huge. And I mean, we could talk about this one for days because the basically your baby is going to get um, the my, your microbiome. And so you wanna try to set your child up with the best microbiome possible because that is what's going to give them immunity as they grow older. Um, yeah, immunity, everything. It, it depend, everything starts in the gut. Everything comes back to the gut. So probiotics, you really want to get ones with lactobacilli um, and um, bifido are like the two main strains that you look for. So here's what I'll say about probiotics though, because you know you can throw pro probiotics at anybody. Um, if you have GI issues, I have really come to appreciate getting a stool test because it takes the guessing game out of the whole thing. And there have been times where I have been working with somebody and admittedly I was doing the exact opposite of what they needed at that time and which is why they weren't really seeing progress. And then we do a gut test, it shows you, and it makes everything so much easier. Um, I, I used, I must've deleted it off this slide because sometimes you do probiotics versus um, uh, antimicrobials. So, oh, no, actually that was on the other one, I should say. Um, before you get pregnant, you have the option of doing probiotics versus my, um, antimicrobials. And the reason why that's important is because probiotics are very helpful if you don't have enough of the good guys. But if the bad guys have already just, you know, taken over and put up, you know, beach houses where they shouldn't be, then um, probiotics don't make enough of a shift. And so you actually have to use some sort of antimicrobial substance. So antimicrobial are usually herbs that we use that actually kill off bacteria. A conventional version of this is obviously antibiotics, um, but we try not to use those when possible. Um, so before you get pregnant, you have that option. Once you already are pregnant, it's a little bit trickier to do antimicrobials um, because it can cause some negative side effects to it. Um, but so that's the main thing about Pregnancy support herbs have been used since the dawn of time. And so whenever you think of herbs that are safe in pregnancy, um, it's really hard to know which ones are safe. And that's because we don't have the studies because no one's gonna like volunteer their hand for um, you know, things that you know, something that they don't really know. To Anything somewhat experimental during pregnancy, and that's why it's tough, and that's why so much research is lacking. And I, I totally understand that, but that's why some of these things, you know, we're not so sure, because we don't want to put anyone, you know, at risk or danger. Right, exactly. Yeah. So the more classic ones that you use in pregnancy are motherwort, 
um, red raspberry and actually not chaseberry. I need to delete that and I don't really know how that got on there. Chaseberry is absolutely helpful um, if you're trying to get pregnant, but sometimes it's not good um, once you already are pregnant and there's conflicting evidence about that. So just to be safe, ignore the chaseberry. Um, but motherwort is kind of like how it's, it got its name um, because it's a uterine toner. Um, and red raspberries basically supply all the minerals that are needed um, to support a healthy pregnancy as well. You know, a lot of these things you have to remember before we had multivitamins you could buy at Costco, we had to get those minerals from plants. And so that's where a lot of these things come from. Um, things that you don't want to do are taking like things like high dose of vitamin C because that can actually lead to miscarriage and high dose of vitamin A can actually cause um, birth defects. So, um, you know, just be a little bit cautious. Ex in, even whenever you're preparing for pregnancy, it's best to really work with somebody who knows what they're doing because you can go wrong even on a natural perspective. Um, yeah, I would never think vitamin C and vitamin A. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. So common complaints in pregnancy. Um, so morning sickness is of course probably the most common one that everyone's aware of. It affects 80 and I saw some, some stats said 90% of women have morning sickness. And this um, really largely due to um, the ratios of serotonin and estrogen. Um, that's what causes that. If the estrogen is a little bit lower than it should be in, in correlation to the serotonin. But so they've actually done some really nice research and shown that high levels of B6 can be very, very helpful. Um, ginger can be very, very helpful. Um, and in certain cases, um, getting IV nutrients can be very, very helpful. And the reason why I say that is because um, if someone is having trouble getting things down, um, there's a, a chance that they're not absorbing the nutrients that they need. And they've actually shown that, you know, if you have deficiencies in B vitamins um, and some of these other vitamins, that it can cause nausea. So um, that's important. But also if you're vomiting, then you, your electrolytes can get out of balance. And if your electrolytes are a little bit out of balance, then that itself can cause nausea. And so then it can be a really hard cycle to break. So the most extreme version of this, I'm going to skip down here to the severe complications, is the hyperemesis gravidarium. Gravidarium. I feel like Harry Potter saying that. So, <laughs> um, so this, you really should get, you know, this needs to be monitored by somebody. Um, but also, I would say consider talking to your provider about IV nutrition, even if they just do regular um, electrolyte bags, which they have very readily in the hospital in most places, um, because what drives that nausea is often that electrolyte imbalance um, that you get as just like this, um, it perpetuates itself, basically. So that's something to think about and consider. So headaches are also a really, really common cause. So if it's a really extreme headache, you really do need to be evaluated to make sure you don't have something more severe going on, like the preeclampsia, which comes from high blood pressure. But mild headaches are really common. And I, I, this is probably for a lot of different reasons. Um, number one being structure. And I'm sure Carly, you know, you understand that fully whenever your body's going through all those changes. If you already have tension in your mm -hmm. shoulder, it can just get exasperated so much more. So um, if it's mild enough, you can do something like lavender or peppermint oil on the temples. For some people that works. Um, I would really consider using something called magnesium glycinate. So there's like five different types of magnesium and they all work very differently. Um, we could talk about that for days even. So you really have to be careful whenever you're getting a type of magnesium that it's the right one. So magnesium glycinate is one that is going to actually make it into your muscles and cause and help with tight muscles more than anything. And so whenever we're talking about structural issues, magnesium glycinate is probably your best bet. Um, so it's really, they recommend Tylenol to women who are pregnant. And if you use Tylenol, 
a couple times sparingly here and there, it probably is not going to cause any issues. But um, Tylenol is not benign. And they've actually shown that there is a direct correlation um, with the amount of Tylenol use and neurodevelopmental challenges in preschoolers. So it's not something that you should just use without thinking. I would only use it if you really need to. Um, and I say that because there are some women who have headaches every day and so they have to use Tylenol every single day. And my suggestion would be try to figure out other ways around it, whether it be seeing a physical therapist who could potentially help you with that structural piece or um, magnesium. And there are many other things that we can do to help support you with that too. Um, so constipation, as we already talked about, progesterone um, slows the transit time. Um, so this is a very, very common complaint, um, not to mention the babies squish and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so of course, high fiber meals is like the first thing to think about, but sometimes that's just not enough. And sometimes the high fiber meals cause even more um, of that acid reflux that we already talked about. So women can get really uncomfortable very quickly. Um, so magnesium citrate is safe in um, pregnancy. So magnesium, as we said, different magnesiums for different purposes. Magnesium citrate, almost all of it um, stays in the digestive tract. It is not absorbed systemically as much as you uh, other forms. And so because it stays in the um, digestive tract, it actually pulls water into the digestive tract and it makes the um, stool softer. Um, you have to be a little careful because you can definitely get diarrhea if you take too much, but it's better than being constipated. And the problem is you really can't use other forms of laxatives, um, ex even laxative herb blends, because laxative herb blends like Senna or something like that, um, they can actually cause uterine contractions and promote um, miscarriages. So you have to be very careful and mindful about something that you might take for constipation, even if it is natural. Mm -hmm. um, anemia, very common, but that's just something you should be monitored for, but I had to put it on here because it's really common. Um, UTIs, uh, oh, I'm gonna back up one thing, anemia. If you have anemia and you're taking iron and you're still not able to build that blood up, um, well, first of all, think B, think B vitamins. That's probably the first thing you think about. The other thing you think about is why are you not absorbing iron? And this gets into a much bigger conversation, but the most common cause of lack of iron absorption um, is gluten sensitivity. And I try not to be such like a gluten Nazi, but um, I kind of can't help it because gluten just causes so many problems for people. Um, and so sometimes taking gluten out of your diet, if you have anemia that's not being corrected, um, can be very helpful. UTIs. Um, watch our first video. So our first video was on sexual health and we talked about UTIs a lot. Um, but the very abbreviated version of that is D-manos and probiotics, including vaginal probiotics, which are safe in pregnancy. Um, and infections, you are at a high rate of infections because the progesterone kind of, it shifts your um, immune system so that you're less likely to like fight off infections, basically. Um, but probably the best thing you can do for that is just make sure that you have adequate vitamin D, vitamin A, and zinc. And this comes back to, I think everyone should get evaluated from a functional level if they really want. Um, but I know that's not practical for everybody. That's something to think about. Um, severe complications, I touched on a lot of these already. Um, Preeclampsia, consider um, switching from folic acid to folate. Gestational diabetes. Um, so if you've ever actually talked to somebody who has gestational diabetes, diabetes, diabetes and then look at the recommendations they give for um, gestational diabetes, they're a little bit nonsensical in my opinion because they will tell them to eat, um, you know, whole grain, whole grain meals, which is so archaic at this aspect of our knowledge in science because that's not what you want to do whenever you have diabetes. When you have diabetes, you want to have a low glycemic um, diet, often closer to like a paleo style. Um, so even just that little switch for people can be so impactful because 
they think that they're eating the right thing and they're just not. Um, and I don't know why there's still such debate about that topic and because we have the science to you know. Yeah, can I touch on gestational diabetes? I, like there's a big um, genetic factor to this too, right? So gestational diabetes, it, it happens. And if you do, um, if this is something that you experience during pregnancy, it doesn't mean that you're unhealthy, that you're fat, that you're doing the wrong thing. Some people are just more predisposed. I can think of two patients off the top of my head who were like the picture of health, Pilates this, running that, and they were just more prone. So it's not, you know, it doesn't discriminate. Sometimes it's more genetic. It doesn't mean that it's on you. And then as far as the paleo diet, I think the one she was just saying like my fats and my protein macros have to outweigh the carb ones. Um, right. and that's how she kept that glycemic index down and safe. Thanks for saying that. Cause it's yeah. true. There's a lot of skinny little pregnant gestational diabetes. Cause it's not about weight. It's about that insulin sensitivity Correct. Um, is largely in, influenced by inflammation too. So a lot of people have like low grade inflammation that never really caused much of a problem for them, but now it's starting to rear its head a little bit more. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Um, inositol is something that we use, it's safe in pregnancy and increases insulin sensitivity. So that's also a supplement that's very helpful. Um, hyperemesis gravidarum, I still have to say that. Hyperemesis <laughs> gravidarum. <laughs> um, you know, I, I already said it, but after you roll out hypertension and you roll out severe electrolyte imbalances, consider IV nutrition, because I've just seen this work really, really well for women. Um, Knock on out. Okay. And what's your turn? Yeah, just, just stop the oh, sharing. Right. Which okay. Sharon, would you? Um, and then just to make another point on the morning sickness and the headaches, um, oh. think of it this way. One of the things I think about too is it's almost like hiking in Colorado and you're from Florida or Texas. Um, you have increased needs of your cardiovascular system and your respiratory system. Um, and sometimes, you know, every birth is different, every woman's different, but it's almost like sometimes you can't keep up with that. So that also can contribute to the nausea, to the headaches, to the lightheadedness, moving too quickly. Um, I think they joke, especially like uh, Olympic, women in the Olympics who have babies every four years and they're professional athletes, but their moms, they're amazing. They joke that being pregnant is like blood doping because you have higher abilities because you're increasing blood volume and how much oxygen you're consumption or consuming. So let's get into, this is the love of my life. Okay, so pelvic floor PT, if you haven't heard of it, we treat all things. Pee, poop, sex, postpartum, menopause, even guys. Guys have pelvic floors, children have pelvic floors. They can have issues, but for the sake of today, we're focusing on pregnancy. So the picture on the right shows you like a bird's eye view of your pelvic floor. And the one below shows you kind of like up and in from behind into the booty, okay? So it's a bowl of muscles that sits underneath your pelvis. We have three layers going superficially to deep. And the purpose of it is to stabilize. So we have muscles connecting into the pelvis, into the sacrum, into the hips even, that stabilize your core in the center of your body. Um, it supports our organs. So we have bladder, uterus, rectum, baby. Um, so it supports those pelvic organs. We have sphincter control to keep this continent of um, urine and stool, right? So we have to be able to contract and make sure that we're not dribbling. Um, sexual pleasure, especially those deeper layers, um, are super important. If we have any trigger points, if we have any tension or pain here, that can definitely limit our sexual pleasure. Um, and we talk about that orgasm being kind of like a gradual contraction, contraction by followed by a big release. So there's a huge sexual aspect of these muscles as well. We, um, Aaron was talking about the skin brushing and the lymphatic system, and it's a very superficial you know, close to the skin system that kind of flushes out the toxins from the body. And we want everything to move from far away back into the core where everything can be recycled. So we also have like a sump pump mechanism through the hip um, with our lymphatics. We have, you know, you think of your neck, you think of your pits, you think of your groin as big lymph drainage systems. Um, and then I just like to give everyone a heads up because a lot of people haven't heard of pelvic floor PT or didn't know it existed. But pelvic floor physical therapy 
um, is like regular, you know, physical therapy. We do manual techniques. We do exercise. We look at your posture um, functionally. How are you lifting? How are you moving? But then there can also be, if, you're, if your pelvic floor PT deems appropriate, which nine times out of 10, I do, um, it can include an internal exam. Um, that is the gold standard for feeling the strength, the tension, the tone of these muscles. Um, it is very intimate work. You never have to do it the first day. You do as much or as little as you're comfortable with, but that is our recommendation. If you go to a pelvic PT and they're setting you up on electric stim and walking away and they're not truly assessing or feeling, call me and we will, <laughs> and we will, uh, we'll have a discussion because it's, I think it's so important to get to the root of the cause. Um, Anything the pelvic floor can refer into the hips, into the groin, into the glutes, the, um, into the abdomen even, and it can be a source of pelvic pain. Um, so that's just, that's my expectation from pelvic floor PT. Pelvic floor is part of, we have a buddy system of four muscle groups. So we talked about the diaphragm being that breathing muscle going up and down. The pelvic floor is at the bottom. We have our transversus abdominis. It's, it's like the corset, think Kate from Titanic. It's the deepest core muscle wrapping around, okay? And we have the tiny little stabilizing muscles in the back. So just to recap, baby's growing and it's smushing our organs up. Our diaphragm can't really descend when we're breathing. So the diaphragm, the function of the diaphragm gets um, a little hairy. It can't work as effectively. With the pelvic floor, it's on all the time. It's a postural muscle. It has endurance fibers. It has to have those slow twitch fibers to support us during the day. With baby growing, there's definitely more resistance down there. So it can cause some trigger points or tension or tightness. Um, the transverse abdominis, what happens, we were looking at that picture of the woman progressing month by month during her pregnancy. The transversus abdominis gets stretched. It has to, okay? So it has to accommodate for baby. It's lengthening. It's going forward, hugging around baby. And then we often find ourselves in this like hyperextended, what we call like a lordotic posture, right? So the superficial tissue and the muscles in the back often get tight, right? And scrunched up. And the ones in the front often are getting lengthened. And we know that muscles that are too shortened or too lengthened can't fire effectively. So these things are gonna happen, but we just have to find compensations. We have to find other ways to stabilize. And then like we talked about too, we have relaxant circulating in the body, especially that first trimester that's, that's relaxing everything even more so and softening those soft tissues and your ligaments. Um, okay, so your diaphragm and your pelvis, I don't know too much about cars, but a piston moves like this, okay? So normally when we're not pregnant and our belly, um, our diaphragm can descend, what happens is we breathe in, diaphragm's descending, and it should give pelvic floor a little bit of a stretch. As you exhale, diaphragm's coming back up and pelvic floor moves with it. So they have this like very nice symbiotic relationship. So you can see when and if we start breathing from our traps, pregnant or not, stressed or not, um, and that diaphragm isn't descending, that pelvic floor doesn't get the stretch that it needs in that range of motion. A big misconception about pelvic floor PT is that you're gonna come and learn how to do Kegels um, and we're going to strengthen, strengthen, and that's not, more often than not, that's not the case. We have to learn to, to strengthen and contract and have that coordination, but we also, especially for childbirth, have, um, for childbirth, have to learn how to lengthen and to bulge, um, and during pregnancy, if that diaphragm isn't giving the pelvic floor that stretch it needs, we have to make sure that we're not sucked up all day, creating tension and creating tightness. Um, Cause we do need some, um, we, we need to be supple. We need it to have range of motion, right? Especially into that downward direction eventually. Um, like, um, since last week, whenever you explained this, like every time I breathe, I like, uh, I like make almost a con conscious effort to notice what my pelvic floor is mm -hmm. doing. I love that. That's awesome. Sometimes you're sitting there and you're like, like same thing. If you're at your desk, you're like, why are my shoulders by my ear? Why am I gripping my jaw? Mm -hmm. um, I always have to talk about this study because it's so amazing. They connected electrodes to upper trap muscles and um, pelvic floor muscles and they showed people a scary movie. And when somebody comes and scares you, if you're watching something scary, what do you do? <gasps> you protect yourself. They found that when you shrug up here, you're actually doing that down there below too and you're squeezing your pelvic floor which makes perfect sense because two of the most important parts of our body are our brain and our spinal cord, our nervous system, 
and our genitals, our reproductive system. So you're always going to protect down there. Um, this is one of the first things I look at. Even before we're assessing pelvic floor muscle, strength, posture, I want to see how someone's breathing. Um, and we talked about how that transversus muscle, how all the tissues are stretching forward, especially that last trimester and how the back is getting smushed. I love to teach my moms to use that transversus. I don't need you to grip in your core all day, but women can find that strength to hug baby in with those muscles and find those muscles um, and not let the belly win. What we like to do is we get a little lazy because it's extra weight, it's very tiring. So we find ourselves here, belly is out front. And when I'm doing this, all I'm doing is I'm relying on those joints of my low back um, and I'm hanging on my ligaments on the front because it's easier, right? We're always gonna find what's easiest for the body. Um, when smaller muscles are not working, we're gonna use bigger global ones. We're gonna find compensations, okay? So it's totally common, um, but we can find those deep core muscles, hug belly in, use your glutes. The glutes shut off and that's what they call it mom butt. You start relying on the joints and the ligaments and all of a sudden you're not really using your glutes so much and your glutes, especially the glute medius on the side is a huge pelvic stabilizer that can help um, create stability within this whole, what we call the pelvic ring, okay? So that we're not getting offset, so that we're not getting uncomfortable, so that we're not feeling like that SI joint pain, kind of like the dimples in your back or right above your bum crack. Um, it's like a very sharp shooty pain when you're walking because the ligaments there are widening and loosening. So those are ways that we can compensate with that. And then another thing, I don't want my mamas, well, really anyone holding your breath. So if you're schlepping, you know, maybe you have a toddler that you're picking up or a bag, anything. I teach my patients to exhale on the effort um, because if we exhale in a certain way, we can trick that deep core muscle into working as opposed to lifting like an Olympic, like you're not lifting in a thousand pound deadlift. Um, for Mr. Olympia. So there's no need to uh, and like hold your breath. What that actually does is makes our pelvic floor clench because there's so much pressure in your intra-abdominal region that the cavewoman brain goes, I need to clench down there like heck to make sure that my organs don't fall out to protect myself. So we learn how to use our breath with movement and lifting and more um, strenuous activities. Okay, a lot of what I see during pregnancy, um, we have belly growing, we have relaxing into the body. Uh, it's very common to have pain. We wanna minimize it. Um, pubic symphysis dysfunction is that sharp, they call it lightning crotch. We have a tiny little joint here. So this is your pubic symphysis. Right. And with that relaxing and the pelvic ring widening, that can definitely be a cause of pain. So it's almost like those sudden movements, you go to pivot or turn, you're going downstairs or up a curve and it's that lightning crotch um, symptom. So sometimes that's due to, we have our groin muscles connecting right along this ramus here. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, one side is tighter than the other. We have trigger points, how we're moving. Um, it all gets back into stabilizing that pelvic ring with the muscles that we can, okay? So symphysis pubis. Um, pelvic pain, painful sex. Uh, usually that painful sex, if you haven't had a baby yet, um, sometimes right after, and I don't want to jump ahead because we're having a great postpartum webinar in two weeks. I love post, I love it all. Um, but sometimes after that, I will say that postpartum is both of our favorites. Oh my gosh. It's a, I love it. Yeah. Um, but after an episiotomy, if you still have that scar tissue there, that could be a reason why um, penetrative sex is painful afterwards. If you have been firing up that pelvic floor and you haven't really been lengthening and relaxing it and you're tight, tight, tight and you're building these trigger points in there, it could be uncomfortable with penetrative um, sex. Round ligament. You have one on either side. It connects the uterus to your pubic bone. So this usually refers into the lower abdominal region. Um, Apparently more so in the second trimester, I was, I was curious to find out more so than the third, um, but it's kind of like anchoring the uterus down. So that can be a source of pain that a skilled pelvic floor PT can very um, gently release and give you um, pain relief in that sense. Incontinence. I did put fecal, not as common as urinary. So we talked about how the bladder is, the smooth tissue is relaxing, it's getting bigger, the kidneys are filtering more, you have baby pushing down, 
we have a lot of downward pressure. So making sure that your quick response um, of those muscles and of your sphincters to make um, sure that you're continent is very important. We, um, we joke a lot and we say, oh, welcome to motherhood or that's your new norm. You know, you dribble when you sneeze. Pregnancy is tough because you have a lot of weight going down. But like I said, incontinence at any age or phase of life is not normal. It's common, but not normal. And it's something that we should address and treat, especially postpartum. Um, when there's no baby pushing down, that's something that we can really address. Um, fun fact, there's a huge link between postpartum depression and urinary incontinence. Um, hmm. And in that's France, they actually mandate, and I'm getting into postpartum again, forgive me. But in France, they mandate 12 sessions of pelvic PT six weeks after childbirth, cesarean, vaginal, doesn't matter. And their postpartum depression rates are a fraction of ours. Because if you think about it, you hurt, your hormones are fluctuating and changing. Maybe you're breastfeeding, you have a tiny little human to care for. Um, and then on top of all that, if you're dribbling and you're using, you're losing urine, it's just, it makes sense how that could all contribute to postpartum depression. And sometimes just changing the control of your musculoskeletal system and your sphincters and not losing that urine can make a really big difference in these mama's lives. Diastasis is a huge one. If you start hoisting up um, from bed or moving around and you start to see this like football down, that's what's most likely diastasis recti. So your six pack muscle in the front of your abs is your rectus abdominis, okay? So it sits on top of the transversus, the corset one underneath. With all the tissue stretching forward and creating room for baby, it's very common that what's called the linea alba in between, it's fascial tissue, is gonna stretch and those rectus bellies are gonna separate. About two fingers is normal, um, especially with multiple childbirth, we're gonna have some separation, but we wanna make sure that it's not so wide that organs are coming through, that we're um, putting ourselves at risk for any hernia. So we do a lot of preparation for that, um, you know, teaching you how to get out of bed safely, what are safe core exercises, um, how do we correct, usually it's a pressure system, any hernias. Um, so how are we using that breath? Are we putting ourselves at more risk for hernia because of how we're breathing and lifting and straining? So that's something to look out for. That's a big one that's gotten more attention and I'm thrilled. Neck pain, upper back stiffness. Like we talked about with that increased curve in the low back, the upper back can get stiff as well to kind of make up for it. So making sure that that um, thoracic spine, almost like in between your shoulder blades, stays nice and happy, that your upper traps and your neck is staying nice and loose. Um, back and sacroiliac. So SIJ is sacroiliac joint. And that runs this side and this side. So we talked about how those ligaments are relaxing and the bowl is expanding. And it's almost like these puzzle pieces, we'll call it puzzle pieces, have a little bit more wiggle room. Um, and if it wiggles just right, it could cause us pain, that sharp pain in the low back with transitional movements. Um, they make a great belt, and I wish I added this in here. I can send the info for anyone who wants it. But the Sorolla belt um, goes over these, like your bony hip bones and over the sacrum, and just kind of like hugs everything in and does the job of your ligaments to force close and like hug that pelvic ring so that you're not feeling that shifty um, sacroiliac joint pain. Um, can I I'll say something about the yeah. sacroiliac joint? So I do cranial sacral therapy as well. So the sacrum is one of my favorite bones in the body, that's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do work with pregnant women um, quite often and that Getting the sacrum, which is like this triangular shape um, bone, yes, thank you for the visual, um, to move in its proper plane is really important. So that plane is it actually very slightly um, moves downward and upward, downward and upward, ever so slightly. But what's not uncommon in pregnancy is one side is a little bit off center than the other and it gets a little bit twerked. Whenever it gets twerked, there can be a lot of pain there. So I just want to say, put a little shout out there for cranial sacral therapy because that can be a really helpful tool Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, the sacrum plays a huge part. And we need that flexibility. We need that laxity in order to, to if we're having vaginal birth or to, to make room for baby regardless, right? Um, but it can cause us pain. Sciatica is a big one. 
Um, sometimes we just have to find the root of where it's starting. Is it in the nerve roots in the back? Is it where it's typically I find with my mom is it's where it's weaving through on the side of the hip um, and we can release it, stretch it, glide it. Um, so that is a big one. Give me one. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and then prolapse. This is a big, we're going to talk a lot about this in postpartum. It's not out of, the, out of the norm that it can't happen during pregnancy, but it's actually the descent of pelvic organs. So it can be your bladder, your uterus, your rectum. It can be a combination with that downward pressure, with alterations in your pressure system. We can be, um, you know, this is something that can happen. I think I see it more in the postpartum population, but just to keep in mind, it usually feels like heaviness down there, almost like something's falling out. Sometimes it can feel like you can't empty your bladder or bowels because something's in the way. Um, just heaviness down there, so something to look out for. Exercise during pregnancy. Obviously, um, always clear with your doctor. And like I said before, every woman is different. Every pregnancy is different. What do you like to do? I think meaningful exercise really makes a difference for my patients. So if you're not a runner, I'm not going to be like, oh, go do a fight. You know what I mean? It's just not fun for you. So whatever's fun for you. Um, and we have to think about what kind of activity level you were doing before pregnancy too. So if you um, did Zumba or maybe you were like a little bit of a couch potato and you become pregnant, now is not the time to start doing serious strength training or, or marathon training. It's just, it's a lot. So take into consideration your activity level prior to pregnancy um, to not overdo. But, uh, but exercise during pregnancy is so beneficial. Um, this great book by Dr. Clapp goes through um, that's a really good resource for my mamas, but they have shown in research that exercise decreases labor time, decreases pain. There's so many benefits to baby. Um, we know that we want to keep that maternal weight, like how much weight you gain during pregnancy an appropriate level, because we have to think about the weight of the baby, the placenta. So sometimes when I'm hearing, you know, I gained 60 pounds, 80 pounds, the baby's coming out seven, the placenta is maybe another, I don't have the exact numbers, but keep that into consideration. Um, and it also helps us regulate that cardiovascular system that is now under higher demand. So exercise during pregnancy is great. If you're noticing pain with it, or if you're not, you know, quite at the level that you were or something's going on, you know, like I said, always clear with your doctor. And then this is something that a public PT can kind of work with you through and make any modifications or progressions. Um, it's great to have a buddy, you know, or a healthcare professional kind of just like guide you and make sure that you're, you're doing all right. Um, we talk about, this is kind of a side, but we talk about the sweet spot for pushing, um, especially in prolapse. So this will be a big postpartum conversation, but we say between 20 minutes and two hours is a great active labor pushing time. Less than 20 minutes is usually too aggressive. We're at a higher risk for tearing. Um, our perineum, the space between the vagina and the rectum, okay? And after two hours, all that downward pressure, typically the breath holding, um, it puts us at higher risk for prolapse. So we say that the sweet spot is between 20 minutes and two hours, and they've shown that exercise really helps um, kind of get this into a, into a healthy range. Labor is, you know, it has great outcomes as far as labor is concerned. All right, so Physical therapy always is a game of mobility versus stability. What do we need to have flexibility? What do we need to keep us nice and secure? So I like to keep it super simple. Obviously I could have gone on forever with exercises. As far as mobility, the two main things I wanted you to hone in on is what's called your iliopsoas muscle. So on the left, the psoas muscle is your hip flexor and it goes into your low back. Okay, and then your iliacus is going from the pelvis um, into your femur, into your leg bone. Okay, so again, getting into this like back it up posture where my tush is sticking out and my pelvis is um, anteriorly rotated, or if you know you're having pain or anything like that and we're a little bit more sedentary, these hip flexors, these muscles are getting shorter. Okay. And if it's pulling that pelvis anteriorly, it can cause a lot of compression into the back, that little back pain, that SI, that sciatica starts, um, you know, barking at us a little bit. So the hip flexor is a very important one to stretch. We also talked about how if that low back is getting tight um, and it's increasing its angle, that often the thoracic spine, the part of the spine in between your shoulder blades, like where your bra strap is, also has to accommodate. Sometimes we get a little bit rounded or hunched. So I have some cat camels over on the right side. I usually don't recommend going into the cat 
where you're totally like tushy up. So I just go neutral and then curl, kind of like a cat on Halloween, okay? To make sure that that upper back is moving nice and happy. Um, and then as far as stabilizing, I, I touched on briefly how important the glutes are. If we are relying on the joints, if we're standing with all of our weight forward and we're just kind of like hanging on our ligaments here, the glutes do like to shut off. Um, something that, you know, some of those hip external rotators actually insert into the pelvic floor um, and they also help force close these joints right here. So your sacroiliac joint. So bridges, squats, um, I put on here clamshell exercises, which really hone in on the glute medius and the piriformis, and it gives us a lot of that lateral stability, okay? And then over to the right, um, we talked about how important that corset muscle is, your deep transverse. We talked about how we're maybe a little bit more risk for diastasis or splitting of the rectus bellies just with all the skin that's stretching. There's plenty of exercises we can do, and I'm not saying you're never going to do a sit-up or a plank or whatever core exercises that you love again. But I think um, my take home from this is there's so many safe variations and ways to create resistance, keeping that spine in neutral and really making sure that you have that motor control and connection to your deep core to hug baby in um, and, to, and to wake up that muscle so that it's firing, so that it's working as you're doing, you know, your functional activities, going around, running your errands, working out, whatever the case may be. So on the left, um, I just wanted to show you your glute muscles. So with the red line, the piriformis goes right into the sacrum, okay, and rotates that, that leg that's an external rotator. So it's on when you're doing those clamshells. And then your glute um, medius on the left, number A, letter A. Um, both have external rotators, both help close that SI joint and stabilize you centrally, give you that lateral stability of your pelvis. Um, and can kind of make up for the fact that relaxing is circulating and that pelvic bowl is expanding, okay? And then on the right, we have that deep corset muscle, your transversus abdominis, and you can see its attachments onto the pelvis in the front as well. So when this is nice and strong, not only is it hugging baby in, making sure that our posture looks nice, making sure that belly isn't winning and hyperextending our back, um, it also is a huge stabilizer of the, of the, um, the whole pelvic ring. I did have put down as far as like pelvic floor contractions, Kegels, but I say, say, you know, take it with a grain of salt just because I don't want you Kegeling all day, every day. Um, but it's still important to have that connection and to know if you're contracting or bulging or relaxing, which brings me to my next point. So what does physical therapy have to do with birth prep at all? Like how can a pelvic PT help me? I teach my mamas and my patients how like prepare them for birth by having them practice when they're pooping. Um, because we can, we can manipulate the pressure in our, in our abdomen so that we're not valsalving, like the Olympic lifter, but instead we're creating pressure and we're breathing through it and we're bearing down, we're bulging that pelvic floor. I like to give a lot of stretches, positions to drop that pelvic floor and lengthen it. We talked about how it needs that stretch from the diaphragm, how it needs to be able to bulge and relax. Um, one of my favorite, and I was going to touch on this before when we were talking about GI, but one of my favorite things too is the squatty potty. Um, helps get us into a good position to practice, um, helps us eliminate stool, because what it does is it lengthens one of your deep pelvic floor muscles, your puborectalis, that actually kinks around um, the colon and keeps us continent. But if it's too tight when we're sitting down and it's not releasing appropriately, it's kind of like pushing stool through a kinked hose. Um, so learning That's a great question. What do you think about the traditional laying on your back position for childbirth? Oh my gosh. It's like the least it's for doctors. It's not for women. Right. Oh my God. Thank you so much for bringing this up because in order to, um, I mean, we don't have gravity helping us like think of cave women. They did it squatting, right? We have gravity helping us, pushing us down. Right. We're in this great position. Our knees are up where the pelvic floor can relax. We know a deep sumo squat, like like this picture right. right here, really helps us drop that pelvic floor. Um, when we're on our back, that sacrum doesn't really have anywhere to go. Um, and that's always a great conversation with your provider, you know, assuming you don't have an epidural, because once you have the epidural, they want you still, um, right. or you can't move even. But 
If you don't have the epidural, um, a great option is sideline so that sacrum has somewhere to go. And then you can hug that top knee into your chest and get into that same position. But lying on your back was made for doctors, not for women. It's a tough, it's a tough position. I love that you brought that up. Thank you so much. Yeah. We talk about doing perineal massage. So um, the perineum is the space between the opening of the vagina and the rectum right here. And this is the guy that's most at risk for tearing with childbirth. So we wanna make sure that it's soft and supple. Um, so literally putting one finger in the vagina, your thumb is out to the side and just rolling it and softening it. We typically say after 36 weeks, this is, you know, this is good, this is safe. Um, I usually have patients do it with their partner, especially if they're sexually active, they're really not as at any more risk of going into early labor or anything like that. Um, I typically, unless it's absolutely necessary, hold off on internal work um, during pregnancy, um, just because I don't think always the benefits outweigh the risk, um, and God forbid anything happen. Um, but then going off of that, there is another article showing that women who are more sexually active in the last trimester have less risk of tearing, which if you think about it's kind of the same idea as massaging that perineum and softening this tissue. Um, but my patients, my mamas go, I think what I found is they go one of two ways. They're either like, my hormones are raging, I'm so horny, I can't stop having sex. Or they're like, oh my God, I gotta have birth. I don't want my husband near me or my partner with me. And they're like, I can't even imagine having sex right now. So perineal massage is a really good um, alternative. Go for it, Eric. Hmm. So as I mentioned before, infertility is a whole webinar in and of itself. Um, so I'm not really going to go into this all that much. All I'm going to say is, um, and you're going to mention this too, mm -hmm. women get blamed for um, it often, and that's often not the case. So they've actually found that since 1973, um, so 1973 to 2011, um, the average sperm count declined by 52%. So that's half. And so I, I wish I could remember the, the numbers now, but I remember I had a whole class on it. And basically what was considered infertile back in the 70s, um, as far as sperm count, is now the average. So could imagine what infertile is now in comparison. So men just have a lot less sperm than they used to. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one very obvious one is this, this guy right here. So they've definitely shown that keeping your uh, phone in your pocket decreases sperm count. Or laptop on your, on your lap. Right, so like that's something to think about. Um, overall, inflammation is much higher, so that will decrease it. And believe it or not, testosterone is shockingly low in a lot of men. So especially like men who are under 30, I like, I'm trying to even think if there's any, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there have been, but most men under 30 have um, testosterone that you might expect to find in somebody over 60. Let's just say that. So almost clinically low, sometimes very clinically low, um, especially if the, if the male already has depression or anxiety or mental health stuff, almost always you're gonna see a low testosterone associated with it. Um, so this is, this is a big thing. Men have a lot, like women's rate of chronic disease has gone up, but men it is too, it's just not talked about as much. Um, testosterone too, do you know, Eric, testosterone too high, can that contribute to male infertility? It's a really good question. Um, I know in women that's true. Okay. Uh, if a woman has too high testosterone, it usually is means that she's not ovulating, and that's a sign of PCOS. I don't know if it can lead to too much. It can definitely lead to acne, can lead to aggression. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Um, and then what I also say is, okay, so a lot of whenever you're deciding between like natural versus um, conventional approaches to infertility, there's a couple of things I think that are worth considering and weighing out. Um, it depends on how quickly you need to get pregnant. Like if you have a timeline, um, you know, that might be a case for going more conventional. Um, if you have a very low ovarian reserve, 
it might make sense to get IVF or IUI or whatever you know you might feel to be the most beneficial. Um, what I think works the best in the most ideal situations is whenever people integrate both the conventional and naturopathic. Because just because you get IVF does not mean that it takes. What you still need is that really fertile soil. And that's what I feel like. So I say naturopathic, but naturopathic is basically equivalent of functional medicine. Um, that's what we're really good at doing is helping that, that soil get very fertile. Um, okay. right. like years. Um, so these are just some supplements that can really be helpful for the men. Oh, one thing I should say about the women. Um, so an oocyte takes anywhere from like 100 to 120 days to fully mature. And so that's why it's really important to at least be taking your prenatals like four months before, um, ideally longer than that, but at least four months um, before you're trying to get pregnant because that's really going to be targeting the oocyte that you produce. Um, for men, it takes them about three months um, from a sperm from start to finish to be formed, which actually I was surprised by how long that was. I would have thought it would have been shorter. Um, but so for men, they want to be taking their supplements for at least three months to really have that increased benefit. Um, and really what you want to think about is you want to increase the sperm count. You want increased motility. So they have to be able to swim quite a distance. Um, and they also have to have the right... Um, morphology, they have to be shaped the right way. And um, so those are some of the things that are considered for male fertility. Um, so these four supplements are probably the most common recommended for them. And uh, yeah. I have to touch on this and I have to have a PSA. Men have pelvic floors and they have pelvic floor dis dysfunction, pelvic pain, erectile dysfunction can in part be, um, can in part, be due to these muscles. So I think, you know, go through the obvious sperm count, go into your doctor, um, checking all your levels, your blood, all that good stuff, 100%. Sorry, you gotta excuse me. Um, but we know um, that the pelvic floor muscles are sexual in both men and women. In men, those superficial, this is obviously a female model, this is Patricia, if I didn't introduce her, I'm so sorry. But there are superficial muscles in men, your bulbospongiosis, okay, um, and your ischiocavernosis that hold or an erection upright and then actually help like propel the sperm upwards. Think like a slingshot, okay? So I can see men in the clinic um, and actually treat them from an infertility standpoint because same thing, we know that these muscles, these are like any other muscles in the body. They can be um, tight, shortened, they can have trigger points. So like we said, muscles that are too short or too long don't work effectively. So if that slingshot can't pull back as far to get the sperm up to where it needs to be and we're stuck, we have trigger points um, or we have poor coordination, um, that's something that pelvic floor PTs can treat too. So just keep in mind, it's not always the women and there are muscular um, aspects to this um, in the guys that we should address and that we should look at. And, and a very just like easy way to think about that is erectile dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. So like that's a lot more common than people like to admit or talk about. Um, and so that's something you can help as well, right? Yeah, and you might not even notice, like it might not be an issue of erectile dysfunction, but it, maybe those muscles, maybe those superficial muscles that are slingshotting the sperm up just don't have enough gusto or they're not strong enough or they have trigger points. Um, but yeah, absolutely, erectile dysfunction is something else that, that we can treat, that pelvic floors treat. Yeah, we made it, we did it. <laughs> Thank um, you for sticking through with us. That's yeah, seriously. So great. And uh, I'm going to stop this. Um, and our participants, if you have any questions right now, if you wanna go into the chat, or anything like that. Otherwise, we can probably stop the recording, but we just want to remind everyone that in two weeks, um, the July 27th, oh, another Monday. What is it? July 27th. <laughs> okay. Monday at 2 p.m. Um, we're doing everything postpartum. So we touched on a little bit today. I know Erin wants to go into lactation, great supplements for that, breastfeeding support, I'm going to be talking about very common postpartum, um, you know, musculoskeletal things that may arise. 
mastitis, pelvic floor PTs can, tra- can treat mastitis, clogged ducts. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and I think it's going to be really great. And it's going to be three out of three of our Love Your Lady Part series for now. Yeah. yeah. And I will say out of all of these different um, areas of pregnancy and women's life, pro- both of us treat postpartum the most. So wow. this is the most exciting for us to be talking about because this is what I see on a really, on a daily basis. I work with um, babies who have trouble latching. I'm oddly a tongue tie expert. Somehow I became one of those. So um, yeah, it's going to be really fun. So I hope to see you guys there. And then just keep in mind, if you register, everyone's getting the recordings after, because we know not everyone can make it with work or homeschooling or whatever the case may be. So as long as you register, we're sending the links to the video afterwards. And again, we thank you so much for joining us, and we hope this was helpful and informative. Informative. All right. Bye, guys.